Jensen has a breakaway. Jensen going down the left. Jensen winds by his guard. Victor Javier released Rick Jensen on that one. For several decades, dating back to the late 1800s, roller hockey and the clunky quad-wheeled roller skates remained pretty much unchanged and always in the shadow of ice hockey. However, when a variety of companies began to make skates with three to five wheels in a straight line, this design innovation changed the world of hockey forever. They gave birth to a whole new sport, the fast, furious, and wild ride of inline roller hockey. Despite its worldwide popularity, roller hockey probably would have remained an amateur pastime if it weren't for one man, the legendary sports promoter Dennis Murphy. An innovation met an innovator, and professional roller hockey was created. This is the true story of what really happened to the first major professional roller hockey league, how it still impacts us today, and how even the National Hockey League owes a tremendous debt of gratitude for its growth and success to Dennis Murphy and the sport of professional roller hockey. This is Roller Hockey's side of the story. Almost had a breakaway chance. He has the puck now to two on one with Joe Cook. The kill has it in the right faceoff circle. Winds, fires, save, and then the rebound trickles in behind Brower. Oh, that's a big monkey off of Bobby McKillop's back. It's two to one. Well, roller hockey is a sport very similar to ice hockey. The only difference, a big difference, it's played on uh, inline skates. Many years ago, it was played on actual roller skates, quad wheels, and had been played that way for many, many years, going back to the, you know, who knows, the turn of the century. And it's played by just about anybody, anywhere, because obviously you don't need ice. Even with tens of thousands of people playing roller hockey throughout the world and dozens of leagues of all types being created, there had never been a truly organized professional roller hockey league, at least not until the greatest sports promoter in U.S. history became involved in roller hockey. I'm driving to the airport to catch a plane, and I went by one of these streets, and there's a bunch of kids playing hockey on the streets with a net and a whole bit. That, that's interesting. A certain Mr. Dennis Murphy came waddling in my office. He said, Alex, would you join me in forming a, uh, an inline hockey league? I said, what in the hell is inline hockey? I'm looking at him and I'm saying, oh boy. So I got my two partners, at that time Larry King and a guy by the name of Alex Bellhumor. And we decided to go ahead and put, try to put together a league. Having already formed three major professional sports leagues that changed the face of pro sports, the American Basketball Association, the World Hockey Association, and World Team Tennis, Dennis was no stranger to creating new sports leagues from scratch. Beyond just creating new leagues, Dennis changed the way pro sports are played today. He was directly responsible for the NBA adopting the three-point shot after his ABA league proved the rule change effective when the two leagues merged. The NHL has sudden death overtime thanks to Dennis's innovation in the WHA league when those leagues merged. Beyond rule changes, the structure of many pro sports contracts today reflect terms first introduced by Dennis in his own leagues, impacting the lives of many professional athletes even to this day. Dennis Murphy is an entrepreneur, but he's also a hustler, which I think you have to kind of be in order to be someone who's creating and selling things that don't exist. Dennis, he's a guy that's always on the go. He's always surrounded by people who will do anything for him because he's got that kind of personality that people want to help him and be part of the dream. And you know, Dennis, you know, bless his heart, he really could, he really could sell ice to Eskimos. Dennis created a professional game. He bought in franchisees. He brought the partnership together with Alex Belhumer and Larry King, and he brought in a structure from his experiences at the World Hockey Association and the ABA and World Team Tennis. But without Dennis's experience and without his brilliance to pull in 50 million spokes into the hub, 
it never would have worked. Now that Dennis had the desire to sell the idea of a new pro roller hockey league, his first order of business was to find a commissioner with standing in the hockey world to give his new league instant credibility and legitimacy. Dennis knew the perfect person was Ralph Backstrom, an icon in both the National Hockey League and the World Hockey Association. Ralph was an innovator and a driver of the whole inline industry. That, that is largely forgotten in Ralph's bio, but he deserves that. So, given what, uh, what Dennis remembered of Ralph and Ralph's affiliation and affection for inlines, he was the first guy that, that Dennis called when it came time to give birth to a professional roller hockey league. Uh, Ralph's response was, Dennis, I've been waiting for your call. And the reason Ralph said that is because he was involved in a creation of an inline skate. There's video on YouTube of Ralph Backstrom skating around in Long Beach or LA on these inline skate contraptions that Maury Silver had created for his son Stuart back in the 70s. Another reason why Ralph was the right guy. Ralph was probably the first player in the National Hockey League to use inline skates back in the 70s as an off-season training tool. Dennis called me up one day and said, you know, I know you're, you've been working with Maury Silver with the inline skate. He says, we're thinking of forming a roller hockey league. Would you be interested in joining us? And it really caught my attention because some of my beliefs in the inline skate and the potential that the skate has. Ralph signed on as the commissioner almost immediately, while Dennis had to sell roller hockey franchises to people most of whom never even heard of pro hockey on wheels. Dennis was quite a promoter. He could sell uh, ice cubes to an Eskimo, I'm sure. He had a lot of connections out there and he always put people together that seemed to, to gel. And in my mind, he's one of the greatest promoters I've ever met. So with Dennis wanting to create something after he got the idea, all he had to do was go back to some of the, the people he's worked with in the past, people like Jeannie and Jerry Buss with the World Team Tennis, got a start in pro sports through Dennis, and Howard Baldwin, who was an original owner of a World Hockey Association team, and there were many, many others, just going to those people and saying, hey, I have an idea. They've been there before with Dennis, and they wanted to do it, and the next thing you know, we've got a league. For many owners, it only took a single call to a colleague who'd done business with Dennis to get a deal done. Well, he, a, a true definition of an entrepreneur, somebody that really was, has been a pioneer in sports. So Dennis got a wonderful, wonderful spirit and I have nothing but fond memories of Dennis. We had the Penguins Pittsburgh team at the time and we were looking to do more things to make more money. And he started the league and we got a franchise. I was introduced to Dennis probably 1971 or 1972. And by the time I finished that meeting, I realized Dennis was perhaps the best salesman I had ever met. World Team Tennis was described by Dennis as a fun adventure and possibly a very lucrative one. I wanted to be a part of that, so I bought a World Team Tennis franchise. Dennis Murphy had that kind of power with people because he had done things that people said would be impossible. So my dad believed in Dennis and would would do whatever Dennis asked him to do. That's the kind of friendship they had. You cannot discount that kind of, of friendship that, that, that exists between Dennis and, and my dad. I felt that we should be involved, but by then I was too busy with the Lakers, so I told Jeannie, uh, Jeannie, uh, either you run it or it's not gonna happen. And she said, but dad, I'm only 19 years old. And I said, well, that's just the right age. And so if Jeannie's willing to run it, I'm willing to buy it. So we tried roller hockey for a while and let Jeannie run it. My dad turned over a letter to me saying that Dennis Murphy was starting a roller hockey league. When I got the letter and went, you know, that my dad handed over to me saying, you know, his buddy Dennis Murphy was starting roller hockey and 
here you go, Jeannie, good luck with this. I was like, how am I, I don't even know what this is. What, what, how do we put on an event? So when roller hockey came up, it was just like indoor soccer and professional volleyball and you know all the other crazy things that I did. Roller hockey, I thought, was just gonna be another one of those crazy things. Even though virtually all of the franchise owners that Dennis got to sign on shared Jeannie Buss's uncertainty as to what pro roller hockey was, with a new high-powered commissioner on board and led by Dennis Murphy himself, everyone had faith and believed in Dennis. He was never down. He had a remarkable spirit to always find a silver lining in whatever dark cloud was hovering over whatever league he was working in. And that's a great gift because when you start these new leagues and you're dealing with a constituency of, you know, in some cases 12 different owners who all had a diverse point of view, it took a real good politician and a good people person to keep it together and that was Dennis. That was his gift. When I started the ABA and World Hockey Association, we wanted to make the rules different from the traditional league. Like in the ABA, we used the three-point shot, and in WHA, it was the sudden death overtime. So I wanted to have a new set of rules made for pro roller hockey that was different from ice hockey. I also knew exactly who to turn to to help because there was no better man anywhere than Ralph Backstrom. Ralph Backstrom was an entrenched star of the Montreal Canadiens. He was the former Rookie of the Year in, in the National Hockey League. I mean, this guy was an icon in Canada. Ralph was a real innovator and a real genius behind the, many of the rules in the game of RHI. I was asked to write the rules for Roller Hockey International and after being involved in ice hockey all my life there's certain things I wanted to really try to improve on. The first thing I did was we played four on four we, because the ice surface in, in hockey is, is only 200 by 85 feet and so we decided we were going to go four on four and give the players more room and it, it was just created a better game and we, if the game was tied we had a shootout. Even though roller hockey is similar to ice hockey, the difference in playing surfaces cannot be overstated. Ice hockey's six ounce disc of vulcanized rubber called a puck or a biscuit was impossible to use on a cement or plastic floor. Without a brand new puck, professional roller hockey could not be played. And that was probably one of the first epiphanies that the founders had is that the rubber biscuit used in ice hockey simply was not acceptable. Either polished concrete or a plastic floor, it just wasn't working. So they needed to create a new biscuit and they set about different designs. 50 people trying to come up with this brand new biscuit. This is a prototype of the puck. It, it weighed three and a half ounces. It couldn't be five and a half ounces like a uh, ice hockey puck because it wouldn't, if it was any heavier than this, it wouldn't roll. But I can remember Anna Willison and Matt Dovin coming in to see me one day. They had a hockey, a hockey puck, an ice hockey puck, and they had five thumbtacks on each side of the puck. And they said, look at how easy this thing slides. And we said, yes, you, I think you got something there. Prototype number one is a roll of tape only with thumbtacks in it. Prototype number two, I went to plastic and put metal uh, runners in there. That evolved into prototype number three. Prototype number three, okay? Worked very well. So we felt that being three and a half ounces, being able to slide on the five pins here and uh, having space for the air to go through was uh, the start of a, a pretty good buck. That evolved gradually into the Jofa Speed Puck. Next up on the to-do list, players. No one was sure whether to recruit pro roller skaters and teach them how to play hockey, or recruit ice hockey players and teach them how to use inline skates. 
Ultimately, through trial and error, it was decided that it was easier to teach ice hockey players how to roller skate. The players in the game were hockey players from the Colonial Hockey League, the East Coast Hockey League, the American Hockey League, the International Hockey League. Some of the players were two steps removed from the National Hockey League. Many of them were one step away. There were a few guys who had left the National Hockey League and were looking for a platform to jump back into the end of the National League. So we had amazingly talented hockey players who were looking for a summer gig. Not many people realize that had they not been out here, they would have been back home, you know, in grocery stores or 7-Elevens or whatever it be. I basically made the team on a whim. I, I really couldn't believe I made, made the team. And uh, out of 300 guys coming to Yale University for a tryout, I got picked as, as one of the guys to represent the team and uh, be the first black player to play in the RHF. I tell you, it was the greatest experience I ever had. It was so much fun. Dennis Murphy and Dr. Jerry Buss wanted to inject a little excitement of their own and came up with an idea. Instead of two American franchises playing each other, they decided to stage a tour pitting an all-star Team USA against Canada's best in a championship series in a variety of international cities. With the stakes and hopes high, some owners were beyond nervous as a new era in sports played out right before their eyes. They wanted to do an exhibition game at the Forum and that I was going to be in charge of it. And I thought, oh no, <laughs> this is the way my career is going to go. Roller hockey, I've never heard of such a thing. Jeannie ran the roller hockey. By this time, I was operating the Los Angeles Kings and the Los Angeles Lakers. As a result, I really didn't have much time for uh, helping Jeannie. Uh, I used to watch the matches for her, give her a little moral support, but pretty much it was uh, purely Jeannie. As a promoter that could help you sell anything that's Team USA, you know, people are going to be open to hearing about, even though there was no such thing as a Team USA hockey, roller hockey team. We had owners like Jeannie Buss, who, who certainly was one of the best owners that roller hockey ever had, and she did a tremendous job uh, with the team playing at the, at the old L.A. Forum, and uh, I'm very proud to, to say that the Buss family were really superior. Joining me now is a gentleman who I've known for a while. He started three leagues. This is his fourth. And Dennis Murphy, what makes this one so special? Well, you know, this one here is a real tough battle, but I'll tell you what, I'm so thrilled about this crowd. It's just outstanding. You know, 6,000 people to come out with a new product, a new idea. I think it's just wonderful. I want to thank the buses for all the help that they've given us. And I hope from here on, it's up, up, and away. Even though I was working with Dennis and RHI to promote this league, never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would see six, seven, eight thousand people at the Great Western Forum, the first game ever, Team Canada versus Team USA, and then watching it with all those people was just amazing. The kids skated out and it was a really good match and, and I fell in love right then and there. It was like this is, this makes sense to me. This is, it's an entertaining sport. It was something that had potential and I was excited about it. They had a very good turnout, a very good game. And she saw, she said, ah, I'm starting to see how this could work. And now here comes the breakaway. What excitement. for Team USA and Jim Howe is one excited guy. He's the assistant captain. He is just ripping it up. And Jim Howe says how sweet it is. Hey, the growth of roller hockey is really coming around. What are your plans for next year? Well, we hope to start next year with 16 teams. 
We're going to really work hard to develop interest, and we've got tremendous response all over the country. So we're there. All righty. And speaking of being there, another gentleman who's really been instrumental in putting this lead together. No introduction needed. He was 13 years in the Montreal Canadiens, six Stanley Cups. He is the commissioner, Ralph Baxter. Ralph, welcome. Well, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. There's no question there will be uh, an abundance of hockey uh, talent for roller hockey, and uh, we're very pleased about that. After watching Team USA and Team Canada games, the executives at the sports TV channel ESPN signed a very lucrative TV contract with the brand new Upstart Roller Hockey League. Even before their first pro game and before they proved their league's popularity with the fans. Well, generally they usually wait one or two years, that's true. But they saw the interest in the games and we had good crowds. I mean, that year weren't huge crowds. But they were good crowd. I mean, anybody in their right mind would have realized how many people were interested in roller hockey because of the fact that so many people at that time were involved with roller skating. All of a sudden, here, here we are forming a, the Roller Hockey International with all kinds of teams located throughout North America. When I say the word revolutionary, I don't mean to underestimate the impact of what roller hockey had on the professional sports landscape. For the first time in a professional sports history, players on a team were playing for prize money. They weren't playing for guaranteed contracts. It was revolutionary. So the winner of the game, the winning team did, earned more money than the losing team did. That guaranteed a hard-fought, well-played game. As an owner of, of a roller hockey team, this was the first team I really wanted to own. I was excited about it because when you, when you have a team, you get to name the team, you get to pick the colors. I really was fond of the whole idea of the sport. RHI opened up exciting new opportunities for everyone who could, as the saying goes, put the biscuit in the basket. No one could deny the league's unbelievable success. RHI was making so much noise in the pro sports universe that even rival sports commissioners were put on notice. Hail the world champion, Orlando! I recall our, our opening crowd, opening night in June of 1994, we had a crowd of close to 11,000 people at the Continental Airlines Arena, and we beat the Buffalo team. It, was, it, it just was a tremendous amount of fun, particularly for a lifelong hockey nut like myself. I like that league. We did well with it in Pittsburgh. We had some guys, Brian Trotje. NHL Hall of Famer coached and played. We had a pretty good team, but I like that league. There were a number of well-known National Hockey League names that were involved, like Yvonne Cornoyer of the Montreal Canadiens, Bernie Federko of the St. Louis Blues, Brian Trottier of the Islanders, even Dave Schultz of the Flyers was involved at one point. So it was a, you know, it, it was a great, great group. One fun story with Dennis Murphy was that he became a team owner of the San Diego Barracudas. One night, he went and asked L.A. if he could play his home game in the forum. And the way they'd make it a for home game was not to let any fans in. Well, what happens, that's the only night of the season that the L.A. Times decides they're going to cover an event. So Bill Plasky of the L.A. Times shows up and sees that the only people that are in there are the people at the concession stands, a few people that heard about the game and got in, and he just ripped the league. He just made them look so pathetic, it was ridiculous. And the quote from Tim Harris, uh, who worked with Jeannie Buss on the Blades was, no good deed goes unpunished. The Blades wanted to help Dennis Murphy by giving him a quote unquote home game at their arena, and it just backfired like crazy. We had to make it 10 years before the thing was really going to be part of the mainstream. And the reason I say that is all the kids were playing it, but kids don't buy tickets, their parents do. So we needed these eight, nine, ten-year-old kids to be 18, 19, 20-year-old adults and have money to spend on tickets. 
we did pretty well. We drew as many as about 11,000 fans for a game. We probably averaged about 7,000 fans a game. So we had to do whatever we could and grow slowly and have people involved in the sport that weren't looking to make a quick dollar, but were willing to invest and keep the league going for that period of time until we could have taken that generation who grew up playing it and those became our consumers. And the next thing you know, this little biscuit sold about three million units and it became the, the official puck of Roller Hockey International and every roller hockey game that happened between Maine and San Diego. This became it, and this was transformational, it was revolutionary, and it gave birth to a professional league, and it actually propelled inline sports and inline skating from a million dollar industry in 1992 to a billion dollar industry in 1994. It was an absolutely meteoric rise of the entire inline industry, and this little thing helped give birth to that whole operation. I knew we were making headway with roller hockey when David Stern, the commissioner of the NBA, came up to me at one of the owners' meetings and said, you know, I'm really not happy about your sport taking over our basketball courts here in New York. And so what kids were doing, wherever there was a basketball court, they were playing roller hockey. And, he, and David Stern didn't like that. So I was like, wow, we're really, we're making a lot of inroads here. So that was kind of cool. Fans, please turn your attention to center court for the presentation of Roller Hockey International's World Championship Trophy, the Murphy Cup. Here to present the trophy is RHI Commissioner Ralph Backstrom and the founder of Roller Hockey International, Dennis Murphy. Roller Hockey didn't just make the NBA worried. In Anaheim, California, for example, the NHL's Anaheim Ducks and Major League Baseball's Anaheim Angels were also getting boxed out by RHI's Anaheim Bullfrogs. So we were the first sporting event ever at the pond. We didn't know what to expect. And we opened the doors and we had 13,148 people come in. Well, they liked what they saw. It was fast action, fast paced. Uh, I think they kind of went away saying, well, it's nice to see the pond, but oh my God, this is exciting. It was just was a dream, really, to do that first game there at the, at the pond there the year after they won the first RHI championship, now the Murphy Cup. And we're still looking for them to put that fifth goal I think the rent the was between sixteen dollars and $20,000 a night. Well, you needed 5,000 fans to break even. They almost sold out the building. So they started out very well, and, and Maury Silver, the owner of the team, said, I thought we'd hit the gold mine. Roller hockey was still very new in Southern California, well, uh, everywhere. So when I had the opportunity to broadcast the Bullfrog Games beginning in 1994, it was a, an awakening, really, because the Bullfrogs were getting bigger crowds than the Ducks, and then the Angels were so lousy at that time that the Bullfrogs were out drawing the Angels at Angel Stadium. When the Bullfrogs open, you know, to nine, ten thousand people, even more amazing. And just the interest and the enthusiasm and the, the synergy of the crowd was fantastic. And just knew that the sport has a place in, in the United States. Several years we had the coconuts, who were these guys that were up in the rafters up there. They had the coconut bras on and the grass skirts, and they went crazy. And they went crazy because I think we had a lot of fun there. Uh, I think it was what's missing in a lot of these sports today. Uh, getting the family, bringing them in at a decent price, make it interactive and add entertainment to it. It was the Wild West. You know, if it were today, I, I couldn't endure it at all because I'm older and more frightened. <laughs> then I thought it was a riot. I thought it was hysterical. So it was quite comical to see all of these people there and of course it made for great radio being up there in the press box and looking down and seeing 
uh, 12 to 17,000 people a home game and getting that surge of energy from the crowd. 24 seconds. Rick Judson gets it again, and it goes high on the glass. Judson fighting for the puck. 18 seconds left to go, and the Bullfrogs could go on. But nope, there's one more run. 13 seconds left to go. 7 to 6 Bullfrogs. Alan Childers slides it over to Chris Foley. He fans on the shot. 5 seconds left to go, and the Bullfrogs cover up the puck. Send it down. 1 second left to go. The Anaheim Bullfrogs are going to go on to the second round. Back then, I mean, we used to get a lot of the kids who would come out there and we'd put on these little clinics for them. That's one of the reasons I think we were successful. Uh, back in the first year or two, we'd go out and do hands-on, one-on-one. You know, Brad McCaw, he's out there, you know, skating, teaching these kids, and he gives them an autograph and he taught them. And one of our philosophies was now he knows Brad, so we want to get him to bring mom to the game because they're going to want to see his favorite player. Every guy on their team, was probably an East Coast player, I'm sure. They were getting the crowds. They had the backing by the Silvers. It was just a top-notch program. I remember breaking my thumb and separating my shoulder in the game because I got hit in the corner by a guy, Dave Booth and Mike Butters. But the penalty box won't stay. I wound up scoring a goal, I think, that game, but uh, playing against the Bullfrogs was tough. You walk to your car and you leave and you go, it was a good day. You know, we may not have won, we may not have put as many people in the seats as we wanted, but it was fun because most of the people left with a smile on their face. Watching the fan base swell week after week along with the ever-increasing cheering fans at the arenas and growing TV audience, the owners were smiling too. That was, however, until the fear of a rival roller hockey league starting up prompted the RHI team owners to collectively make one fatal mistake. Expanding from 12 teams to 24 was sudden death for the league. So once you form the league and you have 12 member teams, then the 12 member teams run the league and the founders become government. And they're employees of the 12 members of the league. They don't control the league any longer. The people that run the league are the, are, is the constituency, which are the 12 franchises, the board of governors. So there's a shift there. At that point, it was recommended that we increase our teams by 12. I fought the hell out of that. And I said, it's expanding too rapidly. What's going to happen? We're going to wind up having to take the teams back. We're going to lose control. We have to do it systematically. And I took a hell of a lot of heat on that one. I think in retrospect, one of the mistakes that was made was there were too many teams in Roller Hockey International. I think we got up to 24 teams, you know, around the United States and Canada. That was the beginning of the end because we wound up at that point having to take teams back, including Chicago, and there were one or two others, losing uh, uh, an awful lot of money, losing an awful lot of credibility. Most owners are strong will because they've been very successful in their business. So when they come into sports, they think they know it. You know, I run my business this way. Well, not all businesses run the same way. In sports, you got to know what you're doing. It's just that the internal problems caused the demise of the league. One of the big reasons for that, you know, why it didn't hold together even under those conditions is this. If you are not really rigid with the team owners, if you let any one of them had the opportunity of getting involved with the league level management to have that kind of influence, the league won't hold together. It just will not hold together. The prevailing winds were blowing away from the one for all and all for one mentality. ESPN canceled its TV contract with the league when national TV sponsors were being undercut by local sponsors that individual team owners set up agreements with revenue they did not share with the league. The teams became lethargic in making damn sure that these sponsors were protected, that their exclusivity was protected. Over a period of time, it kept loosening up and loosening up and loosening up until finally we lost, the league lost credibility to all of the major manufacturers. And when you lose credibility, you don't get it back. It's gone. It was irreparable, there was no going back, 
and it was just a matter of how quickly the league would cascade into disrepair. And it also was the reason that the league collapsed, and it took five years for it to unravel. Also, the one thing that helped build the sport of roller hockey, the puck, tore down the league and became the fatal blow to Dennis Murphy's dream. Alex Bellumer was the guy who handled the equipment and the development part of it. We paid for all the, the costs for the R&D, the, the engineering, the building of it, and Alex promised us the whole time under the thing that we would have the manufacturing rights to it, which we were very happy with. We went through, built it, got it going, and then it started to take off. I do think that roller hockey had all the right ingredients to the point where the manufacturing of the puck that we used, uh, the way the economics behind it would just make our sport even that much bigger. As far as the puck goes, everybody contributed a little bit. We had a lot of people in REGI put a lot of work into this puck and uh, the, the, we all should have benef benefited from it, but we didn't. On the accounting, in less than three years, gross amount was in excess of $1 million. The net amount, it was somewhere between $200,000 and $250,000 annually, that went, and growing, and growing. Monies that went into the coffers of Roller Hockey International. The profits from this puck, as far as I know, never made it to the pockets of the team owners. So when a team owner is investing a million, two million, five million dollars in a team expecting to have some return from league operations and league licensing and it never happened, there were problems. Problems. And more problems. <laughs> this is after Larry King bought out my partner. Larry wanted the power. And you ask Dennis, he regrets he did, he did that. It's a bad decision. Uh, and I think if he and I stuck in there, this league would still be going. When Larry took over at that point, he was supposed to oversee all legal matters. He did not. He completely omitted that from his mind, allowing this to happen. And that was the kind of thing that we had with the puck, that whatever puck our league decided to use was the one that the kids had to have. And, you know, that that's, you know, Football doesn't have that, nobody had that, but we had the ability to really create um, something big. Could you imagine for every basketball sold in the world, the NBA made a royalty? That would be pretty good. And so we just, we just had all the right things to, uh, to put it together, but it just, it just fell apart. Shortly after the expansion and continuing puck controversy, nothing could save the league at that point, and a shorthanded RHI folded in 1999. That was disappointing, that was heartbreaking to me, because I thought that this was finally something that was going to become part of the mainstream sports world as we know it. So while there were so many positives that came out of working with Dennis, there was also some frustrations and disappointments because I really wanted the Roller Hockey League to be around forever. Other Roller Hockey Leagues attempted to follow in RHI's footsteps. Back in 1997, about when RHI was starting to uh, fall apart at the seams, really. There were some other owners, mainly in the south and then on the west coast, that created MLRH, Major League Roller Hockey. Major League Roller Hockey is the only full contact professional hockey league. Currently, we're in the US and Europe. We have close to 30 teams. Teams play for a $10,000 cash prize. They have a regular season followed by the playoffs where we have a North American champion, and then that champion this year will go to Europe to compete with the top European teams. So that's what we do with Major League Roller Hockey. My association with Dennis Murphy, along with being a, a hockey director, gave me the inspiration in 2004 to start a league called the Elite League, which later became IHA, the Inline Hockey Association. But without Dennis, I never would have been motivated to want to do it. Being able to be there 
and see the day-to-day -day operations from Dennis's viewpoint and, and learning what I did from him made it possible for me to go ahead and look into this venture and try my own pro league during 2004 and 2005. Today there are several active roller hockey leagues. The American Inline Hockey League, Major League Roller Hockey and the Professional Inline Hockey Association all operating in North America. However, none can claim to be a truly professional league with player salaries and even fewer are able to find stability. We were a regional pro league with six teams based here in Orange County and it was made up of some of the best roller hockey players in the world. It was also made up of quite a few former roller hockey international players that were still lingering about from their RHI days. Needs to say it was still the same players, same great players, and it was great hockey. Unfortunately, it just didn't last very long. Roller Hockey International may be gone, but thanks to RHI's rule innovations, professional roller hockey's impact is still felt today on how pro ice hockey is played in the National Hockey League as well as affecting the people who currently participate in it. The immediate lasting impact of Roller Hockey International can be seen right now in the National Hockey League. Some of the things we did in Roller Hockey were adapted by the by National Hockey League and uh, we think National Hockey League is very wise in, in doing what they're doing with the, the rules they have today. The overtime rule of the National Hockey League changed when they saw what happened in RHI. They now play four on four. Well, our game was, was played entirely four on four. They saw how much open space and how much offense can happen when it's four on four. They instituted a shootout because they saw the success and how much the fans loved and embraced the shootout in RHI. And these rules were driven by Ralph Backstrom, but created by Dennis Murphy. The National Hockey League today is entirely different than it was 20 years ago because of Roller Hockey International. Beyond its lasting impact on the ice, RHI also helped players, coaches, administrators, and even team owners gain valuable experience. Those who worked closely with Dennis Murphy benefited the most. I was commissioner of Roller Hockey International for about seven years and been through it all with the Roller Hockey and taught me an awful lot and it prepared me for when I became uh, President General Manager of the Colorado Eagles of the Central Hockey League. And as just a few days ago, we had our 300th consecutive sellout, so we've done very well. To this day, I don't know one owner that doesn't count Dennis Murphy as one of his or her best friends. I had, a, I, I had an absolute blast. Well, there's so many things I love about Dennis Murphy and being involved in roller hockey and being involved with kind of wheeler dealer like Dennis Murphy helped prepare me for my current position as executive vice president of the Lakers. I learned about promotion and marketing because Dennis was that type of a guy that he was a teacher and, and, and great at supporting you. We've learned an awful lot from Roller Hockey International. All the right things to do and all the wrong things to do. And uh, getting the right team together on speed hockey was difficult. It's got to be a different type of game. The same, only different, like a made-for-television special event. Beyond having fun as an inline hockey player, some have parlayed that experience into long and successful careers in the National Hockey League. Bobby Ryan of the Anaheim Ducks, Sam Gagne of the Edmonton Oilers, and Paul Stastny of the Colorado Avalanche all started their pro careers in roller hockey. Today, roller hockey is played in nearly 60 countries. With more and more men and women making roller hockey their sport of choice, is it possible North America will see a return of pro roller hockey? One of the big things you're hearing from NHL scouts are a lot of the inline players nowadays have better hands than the traditional ice hockey players. So inline hockey is experiencing a huge boom as we can see at the event we're at right now with the AAU Junior Olympics. Uh, NARCH, which is in Toronto, Canada right now, uh, they have an amazing 200 plus teams and State Wars hockey this summer is completely sold out. So the sport is on a huge regrowth. So I am definitely seeing that there's more women playing roller hockey nowadays. I believe this year's USA Trials is going to be one of our largest. Quite a few 
ladies will be coming out to that, and especially when you have the younger generations coming up and the tryouts are being held here in Southern California. So just with how huge inline hockey is down here, we're going to get a huge turnout. Here at the rink, uh, Irvine Inline, we, uh, we have leagues that participate all throughout the day and night, and it, it wouldn't be if we weren't successful and didn't see the, the sport growing and thriving once again. We're really excited to see that, and especially now, a lot of the guys that are my age, we're all starting to have kids. My two daughters, they play hockey. I think we're going to see another big insurgence of roller hockey players after seeing a lot of the, a lot of the people that are my age starting to have kids. It's going to be the second generation of roller hockey people. I know that you know men's inline hockey is in the world game, so that's that's a step in the right direction. But I th definitely think that women could hold a really high level and standard for inline hockey if they got together like a women's professional league. The adult leagues that are all growing, we have games that go as late as midnight. We have three rinks here at this facility, and we're able to fill it here in Southern California. You know, of all places to think to play hockey, Southern California is a hotbed. Since the collapse of RHI, no other sports promoter has managed to bring roller hockey back to its past glory. But a line change may be in the works. One man is investigating the potential to bring back pro roller hockey, and that man is Dennis Murphy again. Upon hearing that Dennis is starting to line up investors, the roller hockey world is taking notice. On all these leagues, so you know, it takes about two years of planning. We organize it, set up our committees, get the owners, get the funding. Over the years, I've developed some very good friends with people in the industry. So we're going to give them a shot. All of them have expressed interest. The streaming industry is, is wide open now. So hopefully we'll be able to work something out with some of them. It was one of Dennis's favorite leagues, and he's always had a soft spot for pro roller hockey. And as usual, it was his idea. It just so happens to be a, a situation where roller hockey is kind of growing in leaps and bounds again like it did back in the 90s, so Dennis's instincts and timing, I think, are spot on. It's definitely something that could work, and I, and I think we really need it. The kids play all year round. They are unbelievable. I have a hard time keeping up with these kids now. I mean, you know, obviously uh, I'm not stealth like I used to be, but <laughs> but uh, I, I I love I love I love the sport. I'm still in it. I coach. I play, and I'm looking forward to a, another RHI coming to town. But the economy is uh, hopefully getting better, and, and hopefully uh, there will be a roller hockey league in the near future. And I think if you just started small, mainly a made-for-TV kind of production, and you really focused on marketing the world's best roller hockey players for a few years, and then expanded, that would be your best shot. If there's any man who can create a pro sports league, it's Dennis Murphy. And for very simple reasons, he knows everybody is the fact that we're now in the stage of getting, lining up the right people. And hopefully we will get the right people. And once we get that going, we'll be on our way. And hopefully, I think, and we all think, that this is going to be a big success. I knew, and to this day I know, that if we had been able to work together, right now, Roller Hockey International would be a billion dollar organization. There is no question whatsoever. Bottom line is that uh, we're going to try. And uh, with uh, Dennis's contacts, uh, we hope we can make it happen and be uh, a lot more successful than it, it, it ever was. It's hard to describe Dennis Murphy. He was one of those who had a deal written down on a piece of paper and he'd have one in one pocket and a different deal in another pocket and another deal in a different pocket and another deal over here. We went from roller hockey to indoor lacrosse to world team tennis. Anything that took some imagination, Dennis was always the forerunner. You know, when Dennis Murphy calls, my dad takes his call. 
and whatever Dennis wants to try, with his proven track record, my dad is in. I'm a little surprised that having seen Dennis Murphy just a few minutes ago, that he didn't whip out one of his famous deals from his back pocket. I thought for sure that this uh, whole interview was nothing more than a scam because I thought Dennis was really trying to start another league. And to tell you the truth, I would have bought a franchise. I'm kind of disappointed. I, I really wanted to get involved with Dennis Murphy once again. If I had known that, I would have certainly nailed him at that time. He's been part of my life since I was born, basically. He and my dad, Dr. Jerry Buss, have been friends for, you know, like I said, ever since I was born. He was just always there. There's something really energetic. It's a gift that he has. <laughs> so I guess we're just waiting for the next big thing. Thank you. 